Perceive, process, perform. Do you need inspiration for your practice? Or do you simply need to practice inspiration? With this series, we aim to do both. Give us 15 minutes and we'll give you practice inspiration. Dr. Darren Pretzel served 13 years of active duty with the U.S. Air Force and is currently Colonel in the Air Force Reserves. He was deployed to Balad, Iraq, where he served as a facial trauma surgeon at the Air Force Theater Hospital. He is currently a practicing oral and maxillofacial surgeon in Arkansas. In this presentation, he demonstrates with a few remarkable and graphic cases how what you see isn't always what you should believe. So we're talking today about what you see and hear. And a lot of times what you see and what you hear really isn't what you should believe. So what you hear, is it really what you should think? So, you know, I, I grew up doing acapella singing with my brothers. And, and you know, every time I hear an acapella group, I just, I, I just, it takes me back. And if you listen to this group, I have a couple questions for you. Is this uh, the lead singer when he comes through? Is he a, an average talent, above average talent, below average talent? Just listen for a second. Pretty good singer, right? How many parts do you hear? Five? Five people singing? Six? How many is there? So, you know, when you listen to this lead singer, you think, hey, he's pretty good. Um, you know, he's got some a average talent is usually what I hear. Everybody says he's a, he's a pretty good singer. But, but listen, just listen to the vocals and see if you can pick out the different people singing this, this group. And keep an eye on the screen. Yeah, somebody said, somebody said eight, eight singers. We'll see you in a minute. Remember, average talent. Watch the screen. One guy, one guy doing all these parts. You count it out, 12 parts. I mean, he even coordinated his attire, his shirts, uh, coordinated the different parts that are doing it. This guy has passion for what he does, and it's just amazing. So what you hear, is it always really what you should think? We said that he was an average talent. This guy's not an average talent. He is a phenomenal talent. So what you, what you hear, is it really what you should always believe? So if you take this clinically, and, or even in your offices, in your office every day you hear, oh, Sally said this, and I heard her say that, and so-and-so said this, and it really made me upset. And was it really what you heard that you should, have, should be thinking? You know, clinically, you talk about, you, you get, for oral surgeons, we get referrals all the time, and sometimes the message that comes across is really not exactly what you should hear. So, for, for instance, this gentleman came in, he had his wisdom teeth taken out by a general dentist that did a sedation, and the, the, the procedure took longer than they wanted. And what happened was, is that the report was there was a broken needle. One of the needles got separated from the syringe, and it was lost. So that was a story that we got. And this is the lidocaine, all the, uh, the surgical history, but he got an excessive amount of lidocaine and excessive amount of articaine and marcaine all put together with the same needle that was bent multiple times to get the local anesthesia. So all of a sudden, you have an x-ray that's sent with a patient. This is pre-taking out the wisdom teeth. The wisdom teeth are still in. This is the x-ray they provided with the patient. Now this patient lived two hours away from the facility. And this is the x-ray they gave. Now it's hard to see, but this is the x-ray that they took after the needle was broken. If you zoom in, you can see right there is the outline of the needle. Well, you can see it's right next to the second molar. But what we didn't hear was that this x-ray was before they started looking for it. So when it got to us, we took a CT scan. And just to walk through, you can see the CT scan. We're focusing on the, the left side of the screen here. And if you picture that little dot right there, we're going to walk through the face. And you can see that dot going by the sinus and then up the orbits. You can see where the orbits are. You can see where that dot is right there. That is the needle getting close to the globe of the eye. And you can see how close it gets. 
as it tracks through, this is a, a different view. Here's the needle right there. So what happens, it went right through the foramen into the eye. So now we have to fix this. So the pano that came with the patient is totally not the pano that we should have received because it was after they started looking for it. Here's a 3D reconstruction. You can see the needle in the orbit. Here's, here's another 3D stereolith model. Green represents the needle that's sitting in the orbit. So now what do you do? We need to take this thing out. And so it's sitting right next to the globe. So a bunch of different ideas. What do we do? There's the needle right there. Well, this 3D model helps out a lot. We can take this and figure out a surgical approach. Here's our options. What do we do? This, this is a trans, you can go through the, or, through the eye. We do this surgery all the time, transconjunctal level approach, and we go through this to repair fractures. We can do a lateral, to go through the lateral orbit. We can do a Lefort approach. We do that sur surgical approach all the time, but all that mobilization can cause some major issues. So it was decided to take off a portion of the zygomatic bone. And with this model, we can represent that, the outline of where the surgery is going to be. And it's a little dark on that slide, but you can see that this is where we're going through with an endoscope. And here is the needle coming out. So something gone very bad turned into something that was not so bad. And with minimal scars, all the incisions are made inside the mouth. You can see here is the needle and the size of the needle that was in that orbit. The plate goes back on that area. You can see the CT scan of the plate in place. And then here is the patient, super excited to finally have the wisdom teeth drama done. So what, what you hear shouldn't always be what you think because the, not all the information was given. So what you see isn't really what you should believe. Look at this patient. Not a patient, look at this person spinning around. Tell me, is this person going to the right or to the left? Show of hands, how many is it going to the left? Left hand up, right hand up. Left hand up. Well, take a look at this. We're gonna eliminate the music and show you this. So it's the same model spinning different ways, but now what you see is the highlights of what some person would see. Half the people in the room see them spinning right, half the people see them spinning left, and there's a few that see it go back and forth. And so what you see, is it really what you should believe? There's, there's, there's somebody sitting next to you that saw it totally different than you did. So we see that all day long. In the, in the clinic, you see Sally come around the corner. She has a, a look on her face and looks at you. You take it the wrong way. And then you find out later that Sally just had found out bad news about her grandmother. And now you think it was a personal thing to you. So what you see, should, is it what you should believe? Let's take it clinical. So, you know, we get impacted wisdom teeth, impacted supernumerary teeth all the time, and they end up in crazy places. If you look at this one, this one's at the edge of the nose. You can see it's sitting almost in the nose. You can see the, 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 the perforation of the, the nasal plate is, is already, has already happened. You do a, 3T, a CT scan, you can see that the nasal um, uh, apertures uh, encasing that uh, area of the, of the tooth. Here's another, here's another one. See that one looks like a more. This patient was referred for three supernumerary teeth. A tooth there, and then another tooth in the, in the anterior, and then another one that was in the, uh, in the palate. So three supernumerary teeth, and with these 3D reconstructions, you could see these teeth. That one looks actually like a molar inside the tooth, inside the nose. A close-up view of that. But if you look at it, took of the operating room, it was an eraser with two supernumerary teeth. So all of a sudden you're in the operating room and the kid stuck an eraser up his nose. Well, when did this happen? So I go out to the, talk to the mother and say, did he ever stick an eraser up his nose? She goes, yes, was it purple? And I said, yes, it was. She goes, oh my God, he did that two years ago. So this kid has been walking around with an eraser stuck, stuck up his nose for two years. And so what you see is it really what you should believe. Let's go on to something different here. You know, a lot of people have, um, different personality traits, and we talk about that, and, and different energies. And I, everybody has an energy cube. And some people's energy cubes look like this. Some people's energy cubes look like this. Lots of color, a lot of character, it's problem solving people. But I like to think that everybody should have an energy cube like this. Lots of radiant brilliance. 
And a lot of times I think people have those energy cubes and they don't utilize them. They, they, they have the clear see-through energy cube. And a lot of times, you know, using that energy, thinking inside the box is probably the best thing to do as opposed to outside the box. And let me just show you an example clinically of thinking inside the box using a lot of energy. And maybe in my case, it was thinking inside a sandbox. This is when I was deployed to Iraq and we would take civilian traumas. And this kid was injured with an with a electric burn to his face. And the patient was taken, he was 11 months old, was taken to a local Iraq hospital and the patient was given back to his father and said, this, your son is going to die. And so the father refused to take that and grabbed him up and headed toward the American base in Iraq. And coming full speed at the base in your car is not very highly recommended. So full, full armor, you know, he was waving down, flagging down, and running with his son. And we brought him into the base. And they called me and said, will you accept this patient? I said, absolutely yet. Here's the, here's the, here's the kid before the burn. This is the kid after the burn. You can see the significance of the burn. It basically destroyed his whole entire lower face. It destroyed his nose. His forehead is burnt. You can see the extent of it down through the neck. So at this point, I'm thinking, we need to trach this kid because he's going to swell up so bad that we're going to lose an airway on him. So traching is what the first thing that happened. So we've got a trach on him. I also said that we need to do a facial moulage. So I, I grabbed algin impression material, took an impression of his face, and made this stent because looking at him, I know this is going to scar down. I mean, this is fourth degree burns that I'm not aware of at this point. And fourth degree goes all the way through the bone. At this point, I was not aware. So I decided to make this, and within, within 12 hours, well, I put the thing on, the, the child's face was so swollen. Uh, so he wore this thing, but it didn't last long to leave that on. I was trying to keep that obturator to have everything open so it didn't scar down so bad. And what happened was, is that it just it declared itself. And all this is just necrotic tissue. You could peel this off. If you look at the slides, basically, I peeled all that skin off, and I talk, took him to the operating room and debrided that whole area. This is just all dead material. And what happens is now I'm thinking, what do we do for this kid? He doesn't have a face. So now I'm sitting there and I say, well, there's opportunities to think inside or outside the box and to be creative with this. He has one opportunity to have his face reconstructed. So there's a thing called a wound vac, and I put the wound vac on this kid's face, and usually they're not, they're not used for the use for extremity wounds. So I grabbed the wound vac, and it's a sponge, and when you put the sponge on there, it causes granulation to, tissue to form. So I decided to do that. Well, it's difficult because I said, I need to do something to block out this kid's mouth because I can't put a sponge in an open airway or open saliva. So I used the putty material, dental putty material, blocked out his mouth, blocked out his nose, and then I applied, I applied a a tissue um, spacer. So I thought, if I put this sponge on, I'm not going to grow tissue. And everybody's telling me, take, take away the jaw, cut the jaw out. It's not going to work and it's because it's dead material. So I took an eye shield and I put it into that area. This is not the way you use a normal, a normal um, wound vac. And so I put the wound vac on the kid's face and he sat like that for two days. And I said, OK, well, let's see what happens after two days. And that spacer, that eye shield that I put underneath there, uh, which you can see I put some sponge inside of that, I put it, I took it off on day two, and this is what we grew in two days. So my goal is, can I grow enough tissue in two days? So that tissue, this is before and after two days. So thinking outside the box, or inside the box, or in the sandbox, or in the desert, this, this is, there has some opportunity here. Everybody's telling me, cut that out. Remove the, remove the bone from the, from the jaw. So I decided more is better, and I started putting all kinds of things on there. This didn't work so well, but this did. So I took a mesh, metal mesh that we used to reconstruct the scalp, cranium, and made these formers, and I started growing tissue like crazy to the point where I had to stop growing tissue and decided to start rotating flaps around and doing skin grafts. So this, this tissue here, I'm going to try to rotate this over and I'm going to try to at least close some. You can see the extent of the, of the wounds. There's no lip. The only lip he has is in the corner of his mouth. 
So I'm starting to move tissue. I took tissue from this area, moved it over here, and, I, and wanted to move this over, but we were trying to utilize this tissue here that we could skin graft. So we skin grafted that side. We took some skin graft from his scalp and put it on the, on the right side of his face. So now we have a smaller wound, close this area in the neck, and we have a smaller wound. We, we did wet to dry dressings for a while. You can see the defect from before we rotated the flaps to after, the defect is much smaller. And you can even see that the wound vac spacer that, we put under, that I put underneath the, uh, the, the, the wound vac is much smaller too. And eventually, we grew enough tissue that we covered over the, the mandible. So the mandible that everybody said, remove, cut out, was completed. So at this point, I'm done with the, I'm done with the wound vac. So now I need to get closure. And, and, and now I need to make a mouth for him. So this is, this is a transition from when he came in and we debrided it to where the, uh, the last day of the wound vac, you can still see it's a major defect. He still has a defect on his forehead. This is the difference in the size of the wound vac. How it went down over, over a month period. This, this child went through 24 surgeries by the time we were finished. So now I'm looking at this going, okay, well, I've kind of, kind of have a, a lip border that we've stretched over the time with that with the, the, the putty mix. We've used that as a tissue expander. And now I can create a mouth. So there's really no books on this. This is something you just have to, have to see, visualize, and complete. And so the, the cut was made inside the mouth, and you'll see that. And I'm going to rotate this area around to create a mouth for the, for the child. The only lip he has is in that left side of his mouth. So then I get closure. And I kind of stopped it short because I said, if this doesn't work, I don't want to pull the other side inside the cheek to make a mouth. If it doesn't work, I want to be able to save tissue. So cautiously, I left that part. But now I, now I need to close the soft tissue. And you, you have to do some type of attached graft. And you know it's a baby, so you can't take tissue just from other areas on the face. So my decision was to take a portion of the arm. Once that got closed, portion of the arm, I'm going to take that, put it on his face, leave it there for 21 days and I'm going to pin his arm to his face. So this tissue was taken up, sutured to his face. I looked at his nose and said, I mean, literally when I was in the operating room, I looked at his nose and said, we need tissue there too. Forgot about that. So while we were there, I attached some from his forearm. And we're going to leave this pinned up to his face like this for 21 days, the longest 21 days of my life. I was in the ICU with this kid constantly playing in music, he was unconscious because he was sedated, but he was taking more drugs than all of us in this room could take by ourselves. So 21 days, I stayed the course. Um, difficult thing to do. On day 21, I took it down. A little scary. Is it going to live? Is that tissue going to live from the underlying tissue? And we were lucky because it's on a kid, it's on the face, and I was thinking outside the box. So here's the results afterwards. The night of, you can see that it's turning a little bit of that dusky purple look, but we, 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 there's no choice now. You can't turn back. And this is the kid after I left that for Iraq. I left Iraq, I took this photo, and left the country. So before and after, when he was going to die, and there, all their doctors said, take him home, your son's going to die. The father said, I'm taking them to the Americans, and they're going to fix them up. And I was the crazy American doctor that accepted the patient. And this is him now. So, so any questions? Thank you.